introduce our next two speakers, the last, the last two of this day, of this afternoon. And in recent years, there has been a rapid uh, increase in the use of Jupyter Notebooks, an ap application, as you know, that combines text visualization and uh, code in one document. They're widely used for prototyping, research, analysis, and machine learning. However, Jupyter Notebooks have been seen as inappropriate for creating scalable, paintable, and long-lasting production code, at least until now, because our next speakers believe it's possible and they want to tell us how. Please welcome Vyacheslav Kobaleski and Gonzalo Gasca, both from Cloud AI at Google. How are you guys? <laughs> I hope I pronounced Hello. those names correctly. Uh, probably not. <laughs> this happens all the time <laughs> in Spain. <laughs> How are you? Lovely to see you. Finally, you are the, the golden, the golden uh, closure to our second day. No pressure. <laughs> But you've seen we had a lot of uh, different topics, uh, super top speakers. Uh, so guys, the pressure is on. I take advantage to remind our, our viewers that they can ask you questions through the chat. Take advantage to start sending the questions now. I try to as answer them all, ask them all, sorry, and in order, but uh, I'll do my best, okay? So that the, the chat is on fire. You can do it either in Spanish or in English or whatever, uh, we'll sort it. So welcome to the attic, welcome to this Big Things conference and we're looking forward to listening to you both. So whenever you're ready. Thank you, thank you for the introduction. And yes, there might be a very small, very small in delays between what we're saying, what you folks are hearing, because we are on the west coast of the US and Pacific time zone. So it looks like the latency somewhat is there, but we will still try to make it as manageable as possible. Nevertheless, let me start the introduction before we'll jump to the slide deck. Uh, my name, my short name is Slava. I, I usually saying people don't even try to pronounce my full name. Slava is just good enough. I leading several teams that um, building different different solutions for making sure that the researchers can uh, productize their work through the different different services that we are creating, and we will be covering a lot of VOCs today. And today with me, I have. Uh, uh, Gonzalo. Gonzalo, do you want to also to quickly introduce yourself before we we're going to jump to the topic? I'm the lead for the Cloud AI platform notebooks. And we're very happy today to talk about uh, how to uh, integrate these notebooks into your into your pipeline. So Slava? Uh, Yes, so the first uh, part will be kind of a dialogue with, with uh, my, my friends in the studio. When we, when we started doing our presentation, at some point I realized that fair naming probably would be something like Hamelops. Um, yeah, I built the wrong slide. <laughs> uh that's the right question so but the thing is mlops is somewhat overhyped and uh uh somewhat broken in many ways and so many people you, meaning by mlops so many different things that it probably would have not been right just saying that we're talking about mlops so we, we because it's just it's just broken in so many ways um so with that, uh, let me quickly show why I do believe current MLOps state is suboptimal in the industry. Let me start with uh, uh, showing high level uh, overview of a very simple usual ML pipeline. When anyone starting with, with their work, they usually doing if you've seen the JupyterLab notebook. This is what everyone have seen in the wild uh, with a several several caveats when you're starting prototyping yes you're prototyping in, in notebooks when you done manual prototyping you have everything there in the notebook you're manually uploading the model this is what we called a uh, level zero um uh, the level the level zero automation level when you have everything uh directly in your in your hard drive or desktop and you're doing man, man, manual deployment um and this is at some works, right slava it's not for um, Python scripts or R scripts. This is just focused on Jupyter, Jupyter notebooks. 
Correct. Yes. Yes. You're absolutely to the spot. This uh, obviously doesn't mean that uh, you need to be hardcore all in notebooks. Yes. Today we're going to focus on the people who do do use the notebooks, and I've seen many teams that are actually building their processes around just your Python code, avoiding notebook step. That is fine. This particular talk uh, will focus on other cases when you do do use a Jupyter notebook. So if at some point you screaming at us saying, "No, this is not how things work," because we don't use notebook. Yes, uh, this means that probably you're not the audience for that specific topic. Uh, now, after you done your level zero automation, at some point we see the teams investing some time to building continuous integration system that allow you to retrain continuously your model that you have on the notebook. And this is what we call a level one of the automation. Now, obviously, as you can see, uh, after that, you can finally create and uh, an invest in automation doing, doing the auto release of your model to the production, to the inference, to the prediction. Obviously, there will be uh, a lot of testing in between. This is a huge level of simplification. You're getting to the level two. And as you can guess, as soon as you close the loop from the monitoring to supplying the signals back to the POC stage, you finally have the full automation from level zero to level three. Uh, so, my friend, let me ask you this. At this point, is everything feels understandable, this model of description of the pipeline? Yes, I, I really like how you put uh, all these building blocks together. Uh, it's very easy to understand. I like the level zero to level three um, flow, but this is not something that I have seen. You know, when you look into MLOps and different presentations, different architectures, I have seen a lot of different things. Just to name a few, data preprocessing, data ingestion, a feature store, a model version. <laughs> I don't see any of those concepts here. Um, are we missing something? So you're right to the sports. Yes, and let me try to guess. I'm pretty sure I can read your mind and guess that on the internet, you saw something that looks pretty much like this one. Am I correct? Yeah. So exactly that. This, this is what, what, what I, I'm talking about. You know, when, when you think of like an enterprise ready machine learning pipeline, this is what you wanna this is what you wanna achieve. Yes, exactly. You're right to the spot. If you do will try to research right now MLOps topics, you probably will find a set of blueprints that looks exactly like this, which can be overwhelming. And obviously, this is the North Star where you want to go. And knowing the North Star it can be useful in several cases. For example, if you're building a MLOps team and you want to, uh, you want to figure out uh, where you will be in several quarters, or you you managing a MLOps team, and this is the state at which you're in in several quarters. Now. Uh, then you can go backwards, you can assess what you have, you can adjust several things that mismatches between North Star and what's actually happening. And other things, if you're actually building um, a new MLOps department and you're doing a kind of waterfall style, you want to plan everything up front, uh, know where you're going to be. Wait, uh, did you say waterfall? I haven't heard that term since like 2001. I mean, and right now all the software engineering teams I don't think they use waterfall. Yes, you, you're right to the spot. Exactly. Yes. However, obviously, when um, we describing the North Star where ML ops need to be, it's inevitable that we working with the assumption that everyone focusing on this level three automation. When we decide, when we're focusing North Star, we're saying, okay, how the end goal will look like. And this is an assumption that a lot of such uh, blueprints having, and this is normal. When you're in, you in the field, you first want to figure out what's the normal best case scenario state in which you want to be in. And uh, uh, obviously, in such world, there is no level zero. Each of these components that you see on this huge diagram, they cannot be used by themselves. They only can be used when you have the whole picture built around you. Now, let me ask you this question, my friend. What's your the most favorite tool for building ML ops infrastructure to these days? Qflow. Qflow. And Qflow is this is the solution for, for these, right? Like, why are we looking into something else? 
Of course, yes, yes, exactly right. I also using uh, Kubeflow pipeline left and right in many, many of my pet projects. And Kubeflow pipeline is a tool that design to provide you the ability to do exactly that, to deliver that North Star, to go from the theoretical North Star to a practical one. And you can even found many, many pictures that says, okay, the, the picture resembles that specific uh, North Star that we just shown to you. However, let's try to map uh, where the seats on our simplified version of life cycle of the automation. If you look on the simplified cycle of the automation, uh, we have this level three that can be achieved with, with investing and building uh, pipelines, for example, with the Kubeflow pipelines. Uh, and there is a level zero. Level zero where you have a notebook, just notebook. Let's say you have some automation that visualizes Bitcoin prices or anything like that. That source code is not aware about the existing of the pipeline at all. And the question now is how do you going to connect these two worlds, level zero and level three? And um, if you would be just to try build a theoretical path from left to zero, you might end up in one uh, interesting but wrong assumption. There are many, there are many uh, chain of thoughts that confusing statements that the tool X can be used with notebooks with tool X can be used from the notebooks, even though it's just one word difference with or from, but it actually what makes uh, a difference uh, between life and death. Because if you can use e tool X from the notebooks, this means that uh, in theory, you kind of can go to level zero to level three because you can install Kubeflow pipeline SDK and uh, inside of your notebooks and use this SDK. So in theory, this means you should be able to simply go from level zero to level three, right? Uh, yeah, but, but installing an SDK into the notebook, that, that's kind of like uh, not what I really want to do. You know, like in reality, data scientists, right? They are using a machine learning framework such as TensorFlow or PyTorch. And some of them, they have a hard time trying to catch up with all these frameworks because they move very rapidly. You know, you have TensorFlow 2.x, you have PyTorch 1.6. They need to understand and, and master that. And now, if we want to introduce different concepts, such as SDK, such as maybe Kubernetes infrastructure um, in a notebook, that would be challenging. And just for the case that, you know, once you create a notebook, you, you make sure like it runs. And regretting a notebook, introducing an SDK, that I don't think it's going to be realistic for my data scientists. And in many cases, you're exactly right to the spot. Surprisingly, this problem even were discussed today in, in Big Things Conference and so many, many talks. It's actually not as easy as um, some of us like to think. In reality, this results in the fact that imagine you have a six notebooks in your enterprise and your department. Out of these six notebooks, if you're asking folks to actually invest and heavily rewrite them in order to enable continuous integration, only three, like 50%, will actually end up seeing automation of the training process. Out of that three, if you're asking folks to rewrite again, to have supporting auto deployment, maybe two notebooks, the two artifacts that originated from the POC of the notebooks will ever reach to level two. And out of that, maybe only the most critical model that the companies build around actually will be refactored in the way that support all the level of automation. So you see, you, you, you see the conceptual problem now, right? Yeah, uh, you know, like uh, you have, we have seen that um, you have provided the building blocks on each of, the, of, of these stages. It kind of makes sense that when you are starting with experimentation in a notebook, and then you are moving from level one, zero, one, two, and three, you want to have a path. You want to understand uh, what do you need in each of these levels and how you can actually reuse the previous step so you don't need to modify it uh, tremendously. Right, so if you want to start with a notebook, you want to end up with a notebook as well. You don't want to start with a notebook and maybe rechange everything. So um, it's really nice that we have now a North Star, right? That's the North Star that, that you presented us with this diagram with all these features. 
But if I really want to reach that stage, I need to have a path. And I think this, this diagram makes sense. Yeah. Yes, you're right to the spot. So factually, what we want to discuss today is the help and what we can do to help to move from level, level zero to level three. And eventually, you will get to that North Star. We just want to make sure that you have as smooth transition as possible. Now, a year ago, uh, we already presented a different set of, um, of um, uh, views, different mindset that, if applied pr practically, can solve some of this problem. Let's just very quickly revise what's uh, being showed back in the day. Uh, we stated that there are several principles. If they are followed, you can use some of percent of your notebook directly in production as is. These principles are very simple, but you will be surprised how many teams actually ignoring them completely. First of all, if you're working with notebook, you need to follow, follow established software development best practices. Uh, and in my mind, people who are using Jupyter Notebook they are conceptually uh, not that far away from niche development, like, for example, Android UI develop development. And this would be a really strange for Android UI developers to say, we, are not, we don't want to follow best engineering practices because we're niche. However, somehow in the market, this is completely acceptable for notebook because we're niche, we can drop all the practices. So the key principle, no, they need to be followed. And the rest of the principle kind of builds on that. Second one is uh, you need to start with version controlling your notebooks. Third one, you need to have a fully reproducible notebooks, uh, irrespectively who is running them, where it sh there should be a way to reproduce exactly the same environment that guarantees a green execution top to bottom. Uh, you should to have a continuous integration system that now can use reproducible notebook and actually test them, verify that they're green. Uh, you, the notebooks should be parameterizable. In this case, you finally can, can enable different tests by overriding, for example, variables uh, with the name of the tables to a testing tables if you want to. Uh, finally, you do need to have a continuous delivery that releasing all the artifacts produced by, you know, by your notebooks. And the last but not least, all the experiments uh, should be logged automatically. Now, that are the principles. And today we want to show different, more deeper set of uh, proof of concept that build around different things and different pieces of uh, Google Cloud um, uh, services that already allow us to implement some of them. And today we're going to show to you how to go from level zero in some cases up to level two, including without almost lifting a finger by implementing some of these principles through different different POCs that you can go and, and, and play with. A uh, majority of them already available on the GitHub as a POCs. You can play with them yourself. And with that, for showing you how easily you can go from level zero to level one without changing any source code, I will give microphone back to Gonzalo. Thanks, uh, Lava. Do you want to, uh, to, uh, to start sharing? Okay. Okay. Perfect. Can you see my screen? Yes. Perfect. So um, right now, let's let's try to uh, land some of the concepts that we have uh, seen before. So we're going to go through a demo in which we're going to be covering some of these uh, levels. And let's start uh, with level zero. Uh, we're going to be using a platform from Notebooks, which is a Google Cloud product uh, in which you have access to a virtual machine uh, with different uh, machine learning libraries pre-installed. We call it the deep learning uh, VM. So you can actually use TensorFlow, PyTorch, XGBoost, or other experimental uh, uh, frameworks as well, like Rapids or uh, Cafe. CNTK. So in this case, we have uh, we have a Jupyter notebook, and uh, just to echo what Slava was was saying uh, last year, uh, compared to this one, we introduced a new feature, which is called the notebooks metadata. So if you're a data scientist, you know this problem. Let's say you write a notebook, right? It runs uh, from cell one to the last cell, and then you want to share it with your colleague, right? How you can how your colleague can run it? 
they need to make sure that the right libraries are installed, the, the same version. Maybe you, he's using a different NumPy or Pandas version, and you just get an error, a data frame error. Or what about if um, you find a notebook online and you want to run it, it just causes a lot of errors? That, that you've probably been there. So uh, in this, uh, this year, we are presenting something called the Notebooks and Metadata, in which if you're using AI, AI Platform Notebooks and you are saving one of your Jupyter Notebooks, we are actually able to write in the metadata the environment that you are actually using. So in this case, um, I just uh, installed the latest uh, version for AI Platform Notebooks, and you can see that I'm using TensorFlow 2 uh, for GPUs, and actually it's version 2.3. So that's writing the metadata. So in case you want to share that notebook with someone else, they, they can uh, know what environment uh, it's actually uh, the notebook uh, created. So um, once you have a notebook, um, your normal development flow will be like, you finish your model at the end of the day, you test it locally, and then you want to write those changes to your uh, GitHub repository. So you can uh, submit your commit, and AI Platform Notebooks give you a, a nice Git integration. So you can actually do it directly from your JupyterLab interface. And what we're going to be presenting now is uh, this uh, second uh, level, which is the continuous integration. And for this, we're going to be using uh, GitHub Actions. If you're not familiar with GitHub Actions, GitHub Actions is a workflow that runs directly in GitHub and runs upon uh, submitting a new commit, a new uh, PR, and you define the set of instructions that you want to launch there, uh, this notification. So in this case, when a data scientist submit the notebook, we're going to uh, launch uh, the notebook. We're going to execute the notebook in the Google Cloud infrastructure. So uh, in order to do that, we're going to install uh, an SDK, which is called the Google Cloud Training, which what it's going to do is actually going to read that metadata that we write into the notebook and it's going to download the right uh, environment. In this case, the Docker container. So we have three products right now, the AI Platform Notebooks, the AI Platform Training, and the Docker uh, Container Registry. So because we are able to know what's the metadata, what's the environment that the notebook was running, we can successfully say that the notebook will run uh, just as expected as it was running in your local environment. So what's going to happen is the GitHub action is going to connect to cloud. It's going to use this library, the Google Cloud Training, which is going to launch this job uh, to be able training. We're going to get the right uh, Docker container. And after the notebook execution is completed, we're going to write it into uh, Google Cloud Storage. So it's actually publicly available. If everything goes well, we report back the state to GitHub Actions, and you will see a green a green checkbox in your in your GitHub repo. But um, let's take a look at actually how this looks like. So this is the interface for AI Platform uh, Notebooks. Um, you can see that um, you access a notebook, you're going to have access to a UI, uh, UI. And in this case, you get a, uh, a URL, which is going to give you uh, direct access to the JupyterLab interface. In this case, we have some sample notebooks already. And I'm connected to my GitHub repository. Uh, I have a, a notebook called reproducible.ipymb. And you can see uh, we provide the Git integration. Um, so when you are actually saving your notebook, um, opening your notebook, you can, um, this is a very simple notebook, and you will be able to see the metadata that I was referring before. You can see that uh, that's the latest version of the notebook, two point, uh, TensorFlow 2.3, uh, version M59. And that just contains some printed statements. But what if you want to download a notebook uh, from any website? So in this case, I'm getting a notebook from the TensorFlow website. Uh, this is a call-up notebook. So it hasn't been run uh, before. I'm going to upload it into my, uh, into my local instance. And you can see that when I open that notebook, if I look into the metadata again, there's really no environment. I only know it's a call-up notebook, but there's really nothing about like my uh, my local um, environment, like TensorFlow 2.3, right? So I'm going to close that notebook. I save that not the call up notebook, and I'm going to reopen it, and I'm going to see how the system actually uh, will override that with the local environment. So this is this is a, a really nice feature 
that, that, you, can, that you get now. So you can see that uh, it's pointing to a, a Google Docker container repository, which is the deep learning platform release. And if you search for that container image, you can find it there. So you can see the TensorFlow uh, GPU 2.3. So uh, that's how uh, that's the first uh, use case: the local notebook and a notebook that you wanna you wanna download. We are able to to get the to get the image. In this case, I'm just gonna uh, I'm just gonna make a I'm gonna add uh, another print statement. Very simple, so the notebook can execute actually uh, really fast. So I run it. It it runs it runs fine, no error. So then I'm gonna uh, go to Git and I'm gonna commit those changes. So you can see here that the reproducible notebook change, I added, uh, I can see a git diff, and we provide that login as well. So you can see the difference between the previous version. Update the notebook, uh, do the commit, and I'm gonna push it to, uh, to GitHub. What this is gonna trigger, um, it's the GitHub actions that I was mentioning before. So I have a workflow configured in, uh, in GitHub that upon a new commit of a notebook, it will launch uh, the execution in, in Google Cloud. So um, the commit was successfully uh, submitted. Let's refresh um, the GitHub repository. And you can see that, that commit now. Uh, you can see that uh, it was submitted. There's uh, uh, amber light for, that is processing. And in this case, I have two workflows. Uh, one that is for validation, the other one is for a continuous integration, which is the, the second block that Slava was talking about, the level one. And this uh, GitHub action workflow, it's setting up the integration with Google Cloud because we need to authenticate uh, with, the, with the cloud. I, define, I predefine my project and my credentials in the GitHub configuration. And these are the, this is how the GitHub action workflow look like. I set up the the authentication to be able to connect to Google Cloud. Uh, that's the first step. And the second step is this, this is the magic. This is the magic sauce, the G Cloud Notebook uh, training uh, library. This is the one that is gonna actually read the metadata and launch the job to AI Platform Training. And it's launching the job directly upon uh, knowing uh, which notebook was, uh, what changed during that, that so let's Let's just review how this, so you can see that uh, the notebook is executing uh, really fine. And if we go to uh, AI platform training, you can see that there's a new job now happening. And it just launched a few seconds ago. You can actually, and, uh, and you will see the, the different options. One of the advantages here is that not only you can, you run into the same, uh, environment, but you can also maybe define the same infrastructure, right? Like if you want to use a GPU, um, AI platform training supports GPU, which is a, like a good advantage over other solutions. And uh, let's do the same for uh, the reproducible notebook. Uh, it's it's working, so let's do the same for the notebook uh, from uh, the TensorFlow website. This classification notebook. Uh, I'm gonna do the commit. I'm gonna push it again to. Uh, to GitHub. So this is a, a notebook that is running some Evnis uh, data set. So it's a longer, uh, it's a longer notebook. But uh, I just want you to see that uh, both cases is, is successful. So uh, if we go back to our GitHub repo, we're gonna see something very similar. You can see that there's this new commit for the classification notebook. It's also processing and you can see there the the workflow, uh, the workflow running. And right now, let's do a bath commit, actually. So you can see the the case where there's actually a an issue in your notebook, right? Like maybe there's a typo, maybe there's the wrong, uh, the wrong parameter in your model. You wanna actually make sure that before you submit something, it's actually uh, a healthy notebook. So right now, this is gonna be the third, um, the third job that we're gonna see in the, 
in the GitHub repo and in our uh, AI platform um, notebook. So we have there the very first one, which was the, the reproducible. And uh, you can see how when we create the, the, the notebook, uh, the environment was there. So let's, um, so that's the demo for, for the submission of the three, um, of the three notebooks. And um, let's go to the next, oops. Okay, let's go for the, uh, let's go for the demo of uh, how this actually looks like when it completed, right? So um, we saw the success case, we wanna see the, the, the case when it actually failed. So let's, let's take a look at this short video. So you can actually find the, the status for, um, for those three jobs that we launched. So you can see that there were the three jobs there in the Apple Notebook. Um, I was trying to say that you, you have the right environment that it was deployed. One of, uh, two of them uh, already completed. And you can see this uh, green checkbox there. Um, the last one of the, the bad commit is still, is still running. So if we actually um, go and look into the, uh, into the GitHub repo, you can see, uh, you, will, you will see the status, but if you wanna look into details, like what might have gone wrong, you can look into the logs, right? But uh, I'm gonna show you later why this might not be the, the best option. You can see how the print statement is, is wrong, it failed, and um, there's, a, there's an error there. So you have two success cases and, and, one, um, and one, uh, one case that is supposed to fail. So you have the, the classification, the reproducible, we have the green healthy state. And let's just wait for a few seconds um, for this for the last one to complete. And there you go. You see that your commit is not healthy. And with this, um, I finished the demo. Uh, we were able to to commit code for a Jupyter notebook without any modifications in the notebook at all. Everything work um, transparently for the data scientist. Uh, Leslava is going to show you uh, next uh, a new product that we have. And um, Leslava, please um, take it away. Yes, yes. Thank you, Gandala. And so let me start sharing on my screen. Uh, and let me know if it's working. And I believe it should yep, be right. better soon. Perfect. Okay. So what we just just showed, uh, and huge thank you, Gonzalo, for this amazing, uh, amazing uh, part of the demo, is how easily you can go without changing your notebook from level zero to level one automation. What is critical here is, A, first of all, GitHub uh, already will, will already publish on the GitHub all this example, but we effectively enabling um, uh, possibility for your ops team that never have worked before with machine learning platforms. They have no idea what MLOps is, what the pipelines. Take their current knowledge and skills and help your department that working with notebooks to be able to automate their processes easily. What were just shown is just a normal CI. You can actually substitute GitHub uh, actions with Cloud Build, with Jenkins, with anything you want as long as you preserve the process that preserve the metadata uh, and you submitting it through the SDK that we show to you. Now, another proof of concept that we do going to show you uh, that uh, will allow to go to level two automation for some of the notebooks. Let me first um, keep an asterisk about some of the notebooks. In many cases, you have a notebooks that are already visualizing something. Actually going to be showing notebooks that visualize some trends for Bitcoin prices, I believe. And this notebook by itself might be production ready. What I mean by production ready, this could be a notebook as a dashboard, document with visualization that you're sharing with someone within your company. Imagine the par financial department that need to see this visualization. You have built them a notebook and there is really no need for you to refactor it and making it in a different dashboards. You can and should be able just to Take the execution from the level one that Gonzalo just showed and then visualize it. For that, 
uh, POC not yet available on the GitHub, but soon uh, you should be able to go to GitHub, see how this POC is specifically built. But let me show you the underlying premises because you can reproduce this easily by uh, piping together several stitches. Um, so uh, as we uh, end up uh, showing you, now you have a continuous integration level one automated system that produces a guaranteed green commit of the notebook and puts the final notebook on the Google Cloud storage. So it's just sitting there. It's IPINE B file with all the cells post populated according to your execution. And if you have a notebook that is a good example of the dashboard, technically you should be able to just view it. And this is exactly what I'm going to show to you. Uh, there is a simple way to create a notebook viewer service that you can deploy on uh, the Cloud Run or your self-hosted, which is effectively an B convert that will take Google Cloud Storage Notebook, convert to HTML, and give it to you. Uh, and if you will host it on GCP, obviously it comes with Cloud AM out of the box. Now, just to show how this POC might look like, and if you do, will invest uh, some amount of your time of reproducing uh, our setup, it could be something like this. Here is a notebook with visualization, and here is the notebook with visualization effectively on, um, uh, on the viewer. So now uh, you have a notebook in your, um, uh, in your IDE, you have a CI that enables level one that builds it, and you have level two, and level two is effectively, this is your production, quote unquote, dashboard that is a result that you're showing to another department and people can just view it. Uh, therefore, this is by design already a full CD that delivers you production. As I said, it's not exactly full level two. There is many, many other production cases that are not yet covered. And believe me, we will cover them eventually. Hopefully um, next year we will have way more different things and toys to show to you. With that, uh, I want you to reiterate that we show to you how to go from uh, level zero to level two without changing the, changing the code and refactoring your notebooks. We don't try to substitute North Star. Our North Star is uh, still what we show at the beginning to you, but we're helping you to go from the step of zero, one to two without changing. And when you are ready, you can start refactoring different step of automation to go to, for example, more pipeline native. You can build a MLOps team who will build expertise in building Kuplo pipelines. And they slowly will substitute things that we show to you to more native Kuplo pipeline steps. And this is the right way to go. But when you're looking at the huge zoo of the notebooks in your company, we expect only few of them will be fully refactored in enterprise grade pipelines, where the rest might reach just level two without being refactoring at all. And that is fine. We want to help all the notebooks that you have that need uh, to be automated to go to as highest level as possible with as smallest amount of friction as possible. And we also want to enable your ops team to be able to help the data science team. Uh, people who knows how to do ops now can easily use all these tools to help the people who know how to use Jupyter Lab. Uh, with that, I think we can move to the question and answer section. Let me see what we have in the chat. We're here, we're here. My God, oh my God. Uh, that was uh, very interesting. Thank you so much. Uh, I cannot believe, Slav, now that you tell me you have a short version of your name, which I wrote to you an email and you never said so. And I was practicing all night like, yes, just love, yes, just love. Wow. And now you come and tell me. Oh, <laughs> I'll never forgive you for that. <laughs> We're running out of time, so uh, we have put time for one question, guys. I'm so sorry, but uh, the audience can uh, otherwise contact you. They know I've done it to all of the audience. I cannot read all the questions, but uh, could you give us more detail on the mo how to monitor the pipeline to react to failures? Failures? Yes. Uh, this is a very good question because, uh, uh, because there are two types of failures there. One is the failure of the model to continue predicting the resulted outcome. When, for example, behavior of, uh, uh, of the target is predicting changes, that is one of the reactions. And that is where MLOP is currently being developed. How are you going to change your, your team? How to do emergency retraining? The second part, if your 
serving infrastructure can fail. That part is simpler and quote unquote simpler because it's very similar to how your web server have failed. It's just uh, normal ops. So the first part will require the whole talk on its own. And it looks like this is, this is what probably we will be preparing next time to dive into. Uh, do you agree, Gonzalo? You're okay with that? Do you want to add anything to that? Yeah, I mean, um, I think next year we will be bringing the whole pipeline together. So um, You're going to leave us like it. this. You're going to say, <laughs> we're going to have to wait till next year for more different things to show us. Is this true? Uh, we're going to have to invite you. <laughs> <laughs> next year, you're starting on the first day. Now that I've learned all your names. <laughs> and actually, I mean, you do such a great job, Slav, you know, with your mic and asking questions. You're a natural, you know. So uh, next year you can come and do my job from here, asking all the, all the, all the you know, the speakers. Uh, there you go. <laughs> but guys, it was excellent to have you, the, the two of you, to, uh, as the final keynote for the second day at the this Big Things Conference 2020. It was fascinating and, and you're leaving us with all these uh, new things uh, to come uh, to wait to look for next year. So we'll have to uh, see you then. In the meantime, I'll invite you to stay around and to join us tomorrow, of course, for our third day and last day. So thank you to Slav and to Gonzalo from Google for coming on our second day. Big kiss to, to, the, yes, to the East Coast. Uh, enjoy your day and we'll see you soon. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Well, that's it for today in the attic. I hope you found it as fascinating as I did and uh, you saw all the different uh, subjects and speakers uh, that we had today it was uh, mind-blowing.